the reason people buy supplemental plans is because they want little to no financial risk, because they want a lifetime policy that they can never lose, and they like the benefits of staying in original Medicare, going to any provider they want, and no pre-authorizations. But with that, there's a premium they have to pay. There's a popular plan right now that's $85 a month. The question is, is it worth it? We'll look at that in this video. So as we look into the subject of Medicare supplemental plans, what I want to share with you in this video are four uh, distinct items uh, about supplemental plans that I think you need to be aware of and really understand as you make a decision about how you're going to use your Medicare coverage. So the first one is how supplemental plans work. So when someone goes on Medicare, they basically really only have two choices. They uh, can enroll in A and B and get an Advantage plan to replace their original Medicare A and B, or they can stay in original Medicare A and B and then get a supplemental plan. All right, so the question is, how do these work? Well, first off, so if I made the choice to say, uh, with a supplemental plan and enroll in a one that what's happening is I'm staying in the original Medicare A and B system. So again, supplemental plans are supplementing original Medicare A and B. So when we think about the A side of Medicare, this is the inpatient side. This is what's going to pay the hospital and skilled nursing facility, maybe after a stroke or a hip replacement uh, for that rehab. This also covers hospice when someone's been diagnosed with a terminal illness. That's the A of Medicare is going to cover those bills. The B side of Medicare is the outpatient side. Uh, this would also be all doctor services as well as what is called durable medical equipment. So one is inpatient, one is outpatient. So this would be your labs and your MRIs and CAT scans, cataract surgery, knee replacements, those kind of things. Uh, all the doctors that you would go to see in their office or they come to see you in the hospital. B always pays the doctor, whether that's outpatient or uh, inpatient. A is going to pay the facility, but B always pays the doctors that take care of you in those facilities. Durable medical equipment would be uh, CPAP machines, auction equipment, uh, scooters and wheelchairs and walkers, uh, nebulizers, diabetic supplies, those kinds of things that we need on an ongoing basis. Again, covered by B, as well as preventive services that Medicare will cover is paid through the B system. All right, so uh, original Medicare A and B, and what it has, it has uh, some gaps, and we call these uh, gaps financial liabilities. These are things you're responsible for because other than preventive services, Medicare doesn't cover anything 100%. There's always going to be a balance of that health care service that you're going to be liable before and there's six particular gaps so here's what we have so we have a and b and we have six gaps in the a and b of medicare all right and so on the a side of medicare our first gap so this would be gap number one would be the a deductible now this year that deductible is sixteen hundred dollars i'm shooting this video in in 2023 today is july the 18th actually i have seven children uh this is my uh, third born uh, daughter uh, her birthday's today uh, so July 18th, uh, 2023 uh, is today. She actually turned 25. But anyways, point is, uh, the deductible this year in 2023 uh, for a hospital stay is $1,600. And that's all I have to pay for up to a 60-day stay. So whether I'm in the hospital one day, two days, 10 days, or 60 days, my out-of-pocket expense is $1,600, whatever that A deductible is for the year. And that's all I have to pay. Now, if I happen to be in the hospital longer than 60 continuous days, pretty rare when it happens, but if so, then I would go into uh, my next gap, which would be uh, 61, uh, 61st day to 90, uh, the, the 90th day, I would actually have a $400 a day copay for those days. And then if I'm still in, uh, really, really sick, probably in a coma, uh, the next uh, two months, which is month four and month five, now I have an $800 a day copay, all right? Now, these extended hospital stays are rare, but they do happen. And when they happen, as you can see, they're very expensive. The last gap on the A is for what we call skilled nursing facilities. This is inpatient rehab after a stroke or hip replacement. So days one, excuse me, days one to days 20 are gonna be zero out of your pocket. But days 21 to days 100, you would have a $200 a day copay that you're responsible for. And here's the whole point. Those are the three gaps in original Medicare A. You're responsible for those financially. Now, on the B side of Medicare, we also have gaps. So we have three of them. The B deductible this year, again in 2023, is $226. Now, remember how I, I talked about this gap. It's different in that it is not annual. You can pay the A deductible multiple times in the year. 
The B deductible is just once a calendar year and that resets every January, all right? The second gap goes into what we call coinsurance. Medicare is an 80-20 plan. As long as you're having something medically necessary uh, service completed and you're seeing a Medicare provider, Medicare will pay 80% of the bill, but you have to pay 20%. And we call this 20% coinsurance. Coinsurance, okay? That's your portion of the bill. Uh, and then the last gap is called an excess charge. Excess simply means that you've gone to a provider that takes Medicare, but is not agreed to under contract to take the Medicare reimbursement rates as payment in full. Uh, in other words, they want to. This doctor uh, can bill Medicare, see Medicare patients, but they bill beyond the Medicare approved amounts. And when they do that, that's an excess charge, and that means they're going to add 15 percent to the Medicare bill. And when they uh, do that, you're responsible to pay for it. Medicare allows access to occur, but they never cover it. And so here's my point. This is the original Medicare A and B system. As you can see, we have six gaps. And so when we get a supplemental plan, it's going to take uh, 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 the, um, uh, the financial responsibility we have and cover some of these gaps. Now, keep this in mind. Here are the top three plans today, F, G, and N. Now, as I share these with you, just know they're kind of in descending order of, uh, of premium and also descending order of coverage. So the F plan is a plan that actually covers six of the six gaps. It really truly covers every gap. Someone on F plan should never see a bill. Now, the problem with the F plan is this. Most people can't get them today. In order to have an F plan, you had to be born before January 1st, 1955, having been eligible for Medicare before January 1, 2020. Okay, having turned 65 before then or on disability before January 1, 2020. So if you're born before uh, uh, 1, 1, uh, 55, starting Medicare before 1, 1, 20, uh, then, then you can still get an F plan. Uh, but if you're being, uh, born after January 1st, 55, starting Medicare after January 1, 2020, you cannot get an F plan. The G plan would be your eligible plan, uh, which covers five of the six gaps. So again, that G plan covers all the gaps, but this one. So it's very similar to that plan. Premium is going to be probably 40 or $50 a month lower. But that G plan says you're responsible for the annual once a year B deductible, then all the other gaps completely covered. Now, the next plan below that is an in-plan, which covers four of the six gaps. So with that plan, not only on the in-plan are you responsible for the B deductible, but if excess ever occurs, you see a doctor that has the bill, then uh, you would be responsible for that. Plus, every time you see a doctor, you have a $20 copay, and every time you went to the emergency room, you would have a $50 copay. So again, we have a little bit more out of pocket. And so remember when we talked about the, in our opening, the $85 plan, that was an in plan, and this is a, a Midwest rate, very similar uh, on the uh, uh, West Coast, East Coast as well. Some places be a little bit higher, but we can get that in plan for right at $85 a month. That same company had a G plan for $110 a month. So you paid about $25 more a month for that G plan, but which is $300 a year, but you don't have to worry about excess, nor do you have to worry about the, um, uh, the $20 co-pays every, every time you see a doctor. And again, there is no right or wrong, best or worst case. It, it just means that if someone chooses that particular supplemental plan, then they're gonna just take on a little bit more liability. They have a reduced premium. Some people say, nah, don't want the risk of excess. I'm not interested in that. And so I don't, I don't, I, I'd rather just even have the G. I have no surprises. Once a year, I meet a B deductible and I'm done. Uh, as long as Medicare pays, I'll have no further expenses out of pocket other than that B deductible. So you, again, you're going to have to decide that. But my point is this, as we talk about supplemental plans and how they work, you're staying in original Medicare, you go to any provider uh, that takes Medicare, and then your supplemental plan fills in these gaps based upon the letter uh, that you're going to buy. Hey, just real quickly, if you're finding this video to be helpful, you can like, comment, and subscribe. And if you do so, that'll let YouTube know that this is helpful information and they'll send it out to others who also need to learn about Medicare. Now, the second item that I want to discuss with you is how supplemental plan rates are determined. Because uh, throughout the country, there's different uh, ways in which states will allow insurance companies to set the rates. Some states, uh, insurance commissioners, allow um, uh, any of the uh, rating options uh, to uh, be chosen. Others will pick actually one that they want uh, the companies to use. So again, it's going to vary, but I'm just trying to educate you about how these really are determined. And so there's three different rating systems. One is called community rated, community rated. 
And what that simply means is this company uh, cannot give uh, differing rates or varying rates to people in a certain geographical area uh, based upon their age or their gender uh, or their health status. Okay, in other words, everyone is going to, in that geographical area, going to get uh, the same rate regardless of age, gender, or health status, okay? Now, there, there could be a different rate because uh, someone is a tobacco user. Some states allow that, some don't, but the point is pretty much everyone is gonna get the same rate, uh, which means uh, those that are older end up kind of getting a better rate, those that are younger a little bit higher rate because they're gonna have to average that together, all right? So this would be actually the highest rates on the market would be community rate, and there are a few states that require uh, the insurance companies to, to use that. Uh, others give make that as an option. The second way rates can be uh, rated would be what is called issue age, issue age. And again, this is a very common way in which uh, rates are determined uh, based in, in the state and the state uh, laws. Issue age just simply means that uh, when you uh, go on Medicare at 65, uh, and you're going into that Medicare uh, in a supplemental block, that group, uh, then you're going to pay uh, a rate uh, just based upon the age you are when you enter into the group. So if you come in at 65, you have a certain rate. If you're 68 and then retire and come in the group, you're going to pay a little bit of a higher rate. But then those rates can only go up if the whole group goes up. On an issue age uh, rating, it's, it's based upon your initial uh, age only, and then beyond that, rate increases happen only uh, as the group goes up. The other way, and this is probably the most common way, is what we call attained age. Attained age, and what that means is you enter the group based upon the age that you are when you come in 65 or 67 or 72, however old you are when you come in the group, but then every year your rate is gonna bump up a little bit. So if I come in at 65, then at 66 my rate goes up, 67 my rate goes up again. Now again, this is where rates are gonna start the lowest. Uh, this would be kind of medium, that's gonna be the highest. Now just so you know, uh, there really is, is, we can't say one rating system is better than another. There's some that do that because they only write one, one type of policy. But the truth is, uh, they're just different rating systems. And so what's gonna happen is that all of these, no matter your community issue or attained age, all the rates are gonna go up because all of them can go up with a group increase. Okay, and I wanna talk about how rates increase, but I wanna make sure you're clear, this is what determines the initial rate. Now, it could be here, remember we said they can't base a rate on age or gender uh, or, or health status. Everyone's gonna get the same rate, could be different for tobacco. Here, this is age alone with only group increases. This is age and then group increases as well. But keep in mind, as these rates are determined, there's also a thing that is called the household discount. And what this means, and this does mean different things to different companies, but a household discount simply means that that carrier may set a rate, let's say it's um, you know, $120 a month, but if husband and wife or significant other uh, will go on the same plan, they're in the same household, then they can get a discount, maybe a 5 or 10 or 12% discount. So once they've established an initial rate, there are possibilities of getting discounts. Uh, some carriers require that uh, both of the insureds are with on the same uh, plan, same carrier. Others just require that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the spouse or the significant other is of the same age uh, or same age range, maybe at least 60 years old. So there's varying rules with that. Also, there are some carriers that give you a discount if you pay with an EFT. Uh, meaning that uh, you're doing an ACH, this would be like a, uh, you know, a bank draft. And by the way, that's the way I would do it anyways, because you don't want to ever uh, miss a premium payment. It could get, uh, your policy could get canceled uh, if that happens. But the point is they offer some kind of discounts. So we have the initial rating with the possibility of additional discounts beyond that. All right, now let's talk about how uh, supplemental pr uh, premiums can increase because they all will increase because of the reality of, of inflation. Now remember, we said community can only raise by the whole group going up. Issue age can only raise by the whole group going up. Attained age can raise and will raise a little bit every year, but they also can take group increases. So I wanna explain how group increases work. So here's what happens. When you buy a supplemental plan with any company, what you're doing is you're going into a group. In, in insurance, we call this a block of business, all right? And so again, we have a variety of ages uh, in these groups, and so the company gives us uh, these rates. Uh, we have sometimes female rates, male rates, uh, non-tobacco and tobacco rates. Now remember, if it's community rated, age doesn't matter, gender doesn't matter, tobacco status could matter. When it comes to issue age or attained age, 
age matters and gender matters as well. Okay, so let's just say we come into a block and uh, we're a female, we're non-tobacco and we're 65 and we are gonna buy that in-plan I talked about. Remember, it had that $85 a month premium. If we get that G plan, that uh, 65 year old female non-tobacco uh, would be right at $110 a month. Remember the difference? The difference is about $25 a month in premium, but that G plan covered five of the six gaps, in plan covered four of the six, plus I had some co-pays with that as well. And so what happens is this, we go into the group based upon uh, these initial factors, so we call this our initial premium. So you're in the group, and what you're doing every month, all the policy owners are paying in their premium. So we pay in premium, why do we do that? To eliminate the risk. Here we eliminate all risk but one gap. Here we eliminate all risk but two gaps, right? So we pay the premium in, that means the company has, is responsible for those gaps. So what are they doing? Well, they're paying money out in claims. So what we're talking about now is how do group increases occur because all of the rating systems, community, issue age, or attained age can take group. Now the attained age, they were going up a little bit every year, every year to kind of compensate for some of the inflation, but all of them go group increases. So here's what happens. Money goes in, money goes out. Eventually, more money will go out than is coming in. That's going to happen with all these companies for sure. So what happens then, now this block of business is losing money, and these insurance companies are protected by insurance law. They don't have to lose money, but before they can do a group increase, it has to be approved by the insurance commissioner. So let's say that 95% of the claims are covered by premium, but that's it. Now they're losing what? 5%. So they're losing 5%, so in order to take an increase, they have to go to the state insurance commissioner's office, usually in the state uh, you know, uh, ca uh, capital, and they will petition for a rate increase of 5%. So their job is to protect you, the consumer, to make sure this price increase is justifiable. And they have paperwork to do, and they've got to prove that they're truly losing money and need a rate increase. And so if the insurance company approves it, They'll let the insurance company know, and that means they'll go up 5%. So everybody in the group then, whether it's community, attained age, or issue age, is going to go up 5%. Now, you could be in here and never had a claim one, healthy as can be. But another person's in here, and they're in the midst of cancer treatment, and they've cost the group 50 grand. <laughs> but both of you are going to go up 5%. So group increases are always going to be uh, equal uh, for everybody that's in the group. So that's how prices go up. Attained age. A little bit every year. The, the philosophy behind that is if they, they allow them to raise a little bit every year, there should be less of these, all right? But all of them are gonna go up. All right, so that's the way price increases occur. Hey, if you're finding this video helpful, I wanna invite you to go right up here and actually click on a link that will uh, allow you to watch what I call the Medicare Essentials Workshop. It's a workshop that I did that really is gonna show you everything you need to know about Medicare uh, from A to Z, uh, how to enroll, when to enroll, and uh, the plan options for you. So, so go to that link and check it out. All right, then lastly, how do you decide upon what supplemental plan is gonna be right for you? So the first thing you have to do is you have to decide what plan do you want? I shared with you, if I was going on Medicare, I'd get the G plan. I'd rather pay a little extra premium, had no surprises, no, no co-pays, just meet that B deductible once a year. Some of you say, no, I think I'll save that $30 a month. I'll take the end plan. Uh, I'll take on the risk of excess because it doesn't happen very often. And I'm willing to pay a little bit out of pocket. Again, there is no right or wrong, but you've got to decide that. Now again, uh, if you are born after January 1st, 1955, there's eight total supplemental plans. If you're born before January 1st, 1955, there's 10 supplemental plans to choose from. I mention these because these are really the most popular right now. Probably G, uh, still more popular than the end plan. But you got to decide upon the plan you want to be on. What, what are you comfortable with as far as risk goes? Then what you have to do is you're going to look at what we call the initial premium. The initial premium. Now, the initial premium just means this is what you're going to pay the first year. Then after that, of course, there can be uh, uh, increases that we've discussed. But the initial premium, as I said, on that one end plan was $85. The same company had a G plan at $110. And I want you to know, we definitely care about initial premium, but I want you to know, this is not the most important thing. What's the most important thing is the stability of the rates. <laughs> the stability of the rates. In other words, what we do is we take the time to look at the history of how many price increases this company has taken in the last 10 years. And all this is information uh, that we share with our clients because yes, I care about initial rate, but I'm also concerned about in three years and five years and possibly 10 years down the road, what's that rate gonna look like? Well, we don't know for sure. 
But what we do know is the history of this company and the price increases that they've taken and more than likely history is going to re repeat itself. And so if we see a company that's been unstable in the last 10 years, probably going to continue to be unstable. See a company that's a little bit more stable will probably continue to be stable. Now what really matters on this, uh, and I'll close with this, is market share. We had a client we were uh, looking at, uh, Prospect actually, we were looking at uh, just recently, very interesting, it was the state of Ohio, and they were looking at one company, and in that uh, group, remember I talked about the block, the group, uh, there were actually 281 policyholders in that company's block. Another company in the same market uh, had 33,000 people uh, within that group. Okay, that's what I mean by market share. How many others are in the group? And the reason that matters is because typically the larger the group, what we're seeing is in the risk of health problems is spread out to more policyholders and that normally um, uh, results in a stable rate. So what I'm looking at is I'm looking, typically I want a national carrier and I want one that's sizable. Why? because I can spread that risk out to a larger group. If I have a small group, what happens if it's primarily full of healthy people, it will be stable. But if you have a small group and there's a cancer in there and other problems in there, watch out, that thing's probably gonna go through the roof, okay? They'll start losing money and will do so on a regular basis. So these are the things that we look at to make sure that we have selected the right supplemental company. So the question is, is the supplemental plan worth it? I absolutely think so, and I'm going to tell you why, and I'll close. Number one, because if you have a supplemental plan, you can go to any provider that takes Medicare, any hospital, any doc, any surgeon. As long as they take Medicare, they will take your supplemental plan. And then secondly, most importantly, your doctor and Medicare get to make all the decisions. That insurance company that you select has no say-so whatsoever because supplemental plans cannot require pre-authorizations on anything. If Medicare says we'll cover it, doctor says you need it, that's the end of the story, and that's one of the, the, the great benefits of a supplemental plan. And if you go with a company that will be very stable, you will be um, uh, comfortable with that and happy and satisfied with that company for the long term.